Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Running for Souls podcast. My name is Keith Cartwright. I am the host of this show, and I am really glad to have you along listening in today, wherever it is that you're listening, whenever it is that you're listening in. I just hope you're out there running, tackling something big. This conversation I'm going to share with you today would be really appropriate for that. But before I get to today's conversation, part of this podcast is making you aware of my partnership with Souls for Souls. And I just want to take this moment, knowing that I'm talking probably to a lot of runners, probably to a lot of people who have shoes, I just want to take this moment to highlight the importance of when you're done with those shoes and there is still plenty of wear left in them, which is typical of runners. We use those shoes for a few hundred miles for running, but if it came to just protecting our feet, walking around, they probably have a lot more life left in them. And it's just those kind of shoes that Souls for Souls collects and distributes to developing countries, helps grow entrepreneurs in those countries who take those shoes and then sell them to folks in their community to raise money, to start small businesses, to try to support the their family, put a roof over their heads, get their kids educated, really work their way out of poverty. And I think that's why Souls for Souls has been such an important part of my life the last few years is because when they say they are trying to wear out poverty, um, they're doing it in a way that just is more than charitable. It actually is helping people grow something that is sustainable, something that will make poverty in their control, fighting poverty, something that they can battle. Um, So I encourage you, go to, you can go to my website, Running for Souls, R-U-N-N-I-N-G, number four, S-O-L-E-S, runningforsouls.com. There's a tab there that will talk to you about contributing shoes, how you do that. You can also go to the Souls for Souls website, S-O-L-E-S, number four, S-U-L, S-O-U-L-S, souls for the soul, the human soul, dot org. And again, they'll have information there on how you can donate shoes. So now that I got that out of the way, I want to talk a little bit about my conversation today with Lauren Jones. Lauren recently tried to tackle the fastest known time for the 350 mile Penhody Trail. Um, we're going to get into we're going to get into that whole story, so I won't give you much of a preview of that. Only to say, I think you're really going to enjoy Lauren and enjoy our conversation. So I am now going to get out of the way and turn you over to my conversation with Lauren Jones. Well, I want to welcome Lauren Jones to the show. So welcome, Lauren. Hi. Thank you. It is really good to have you here. We're going to be talking about a recent um, really big run (laughs) you did that sort of blows my mind. But before we get there, I'm always really curious, especially folks who try big, crazy running things like you just tackled. How did you ever get your start running to begin with? Uh, It started a while back when I moved from Baltimore back to Atlanta. Uh, my friend from Baltimore wanted me to come back and visit and run a half marathon. And I thought she was crazy. So I said no at first. <laughs> uh, but she wore me down and uh, con- convinced me to do it finally. And I actually had a blast. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So I did a couple half marathons with her uh, and a couple marathons after that. And uh, I was hooked. Yeah. How long ago was that? Uh, that was when I moved back. That was 2012. So, I mean, not a, not a terrible long time. I mean, no, 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 not crazy. Yeah. what was it really about that first half marathon that made you um, not say this is a really crazy idea and, and, and keep going? Uh, I think by finally just training for it and then doing it, I realized that like it seemed scarier thinking about it than it actually was doing it. And I was just so excited that I was able to do it and actually felt really good at the end. I didn't feel like I was dying. And I was like, oh, this isn't so bad. This is kind of fun. Like, I wonder what else I can do, you know? 
Yeah, no. Well, I always say when I ran my um, when I ran my first marathon, that was that was sort of the big question that that came to me. I wasn't crossing the finish line. I wasn't nearly as much celebrating what I had just done. I was like, "This holy cow! What what else? What else can I do?" Um, yeah, really. So you went on from that half half marathon to run a couple of uh, marathons. When did you, because, you know, you're, you're, you do a lot of long runs out on the trails now. When did you first dabble with the trails? Uh, it was after my first couple of marathons. I think I did two road marathons and had the same kind of feeling of like, wow, I didn't, I thought, I thought that would be so much harder than it was. Not that it wasn't hard, but I just thought it was like an impossible. And so the fact that I could do it like I could do it. Clearly it's not impossible. The rest of the world could do it if I can do it. Um, so I might as well like, let's just see what else there is. Like that wasn't so terrible. I didn't die. Let's just see what else there is. And like, let's, can I go a little bit longer? And then once you start getting in, like, you know, just doing some internet searches and looking for longer stuff and it turns out everything longer is on trails. So I was like, okay, fine. I guess I'll try trails. It was terrifying to me. It seemed hard. Uh, and I found a 50 K and decided just to go for it and train for that and do it. Now we're growing up, were you like an outdoorsy run around in the woods type girl or was that really just, no. <laughs> for those of who can't see her, she is like very adamantly shaking her head. No, that was <laughs> no. not me. I hated camping. I hated being in the woods. I hated anything outside. I hated running all of it. I hated all of it. So you weren't even like, you weren't into sports or anything like that growing up. Terribly so now, athletic. I did ballet, uh, which is not the same. Uh, that was it. I was terrible at everything else. My soccer coach, my sister and I played soccer for one year growing up and our soccer coach made fun of us because we were so bad at it. So, <laughs> yeah, that was my one sport thing. <laughs> Well then, so you're in, you know, you're starting to get into this running thing. What, what is it about it that you're, you know, starting to, I mean, clearly it's more than figuring out, oh, wow, I can do that. What is it doing something for you inside? What, what other benefits are you starting to take away from this whole running thing? Oh, uh, gosh. Yeah, it's a lot. I think it's a lot of those same feelings of like, I can't believe I can do something I thought sounded so crazy. Um, I can't believe I can do something and actually not feel like I'm dying while I'm doing it. Um, just a lot of like, I don't know, self-validation if that's a word yeah. uh, or a concept, but uh, just feeling like you've achieved something, feeling like you've done something you thought was impossible before. Feels pretty good. No, I think if I'm right, you're a nurse. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So how does, you know, how does running help you manage? I mean, being a nurse to me has always sounded like a really tough job. I think nowadays it sounds like an even tougher job. How does running help you out there? Uh, I think it goes the other way, honestly. I think um, nursing helps my running, if that makes any sense. Um, I think one of the most stark things that like I came back from this big run feeling like I failed and all the things. And then I immediately came back to work to take care of a kid that will never have the opportunity to try anything like I even tried. Like it just won't even be on, it's just not in the cards for that kid. And to realize how lucky you are to even get to try those things um, is super motivating. Um, and so like that, I think it's just grounding to come back and realize like this is the real world and this is like what's actually happening. And I get to go try all these crazy things and why not try them while I have the ability to do it? I'm not sure anybody's ever answered it that way. And that's, that <laughs> is pretty powerful. I mean, usually we talk in terms of how running prepares us for this other side of our life. Like we don't count running a lot of times as like our real life. But I um, recently followed along this big run you took on. It's no longer like half marathons. It's no longer marathons. It's like, why not do like, 10 or 11 of them in one run you you recently um tackled you were going after the fastest known time on the penhati trail 350 miles 
the record was five days, 13 hours and 21 minutes. Right. Clearly, clearly we've leapt from, you know, a couple hour half marathon to like, <laughs> now we're going to spend days out there. Yeah. So I was reading your race report, which I will include with this when we, when we share it. And it sounds like this all started with 2019. Sounds like it was a challenging running year for you. What, what was so challenging about 2019? Uh, I had just come off a pretty big year of a lot of 100 mile races and um, which is great. I had a great year and did really great at the Pinhoti 100. Um, but I just kind of felt unmotivated moving into 2019, just kind of overtrained and not excited to get out there. Um, and so I just wasn't really itching to go run, itching to train hard. I definitely lost some fitness. Um, in the meantime, I also met my now boyfriend uh tim and he's awesome uh but it left me like definitely not motivated to go leave for an entire day to go run all day in the woods because i really wanted to hang out with him you know which i think is a great it's a great thing yeah uh, but it definitely left me with a year of like not really training very hard and not really working for anything um but i had gotten into the leadville 100 which i was very excited to finally get into it took me several years of the lottery to finally get in uh, so, you know, untrained or not, I was going to go run it anyways. Uh, so I showed up and I think part of the training physically is just like also mental training. Um, I didn't have any of it. I was just winging it when I showed up there. I was just excited to see like a cool town I'd never been to, cool mountains I'd never run on, a huge race, you know. Uh, I had a great time. The first like 30 miles was amazing. I had a like perfect day. It was lovely. Uh, and then you get to Twin Lakes and you have to go up Hope Pass, uh, which, you know, the whole race for Leadville is basically above 10,000 feet or at 10,000 feet. And then you go up Hope Pass, which gets you around 12,500, close to 13,000 feet, which for someone who lives at basically sea level, it's pretty high. Right. Uh, and it's straight up uh, four miles. And so you go up Hope Pass and back down. And then you turn around, you do it right again, because it's the turnaround point. And I was just kind of broken. It took me almost eight hours to go 20 miles, which is not a regular thing in my life. And I couldn't believe how slow I was going. I couldn't believe how far back in the pack of people I was. Starting to chase cutoffs. It was just a different world. And uh, mentally, I just wasn't ready. Physically wasn't ready. Uh, ended up uh, DNFing. I missed a cutoff at like mile 65. And that's the first time in my life I've ever battled cutoffs. <laughs> and that was just a really rough place to be. And like leaving that uh, DNF, it like it really stung. Um, it really stuck with me. You know, I've DNF'd other things, but that one was just like 100% my fault. I just wasn't ready. Didn't come into it ready. Didn't come into it fighting at all. I just kind of gave up. Uh, and so I don't really do well with stuff like that. Um, I like to kind of fight for stuff and go for it. So it kind of fired me up and I was like, okay, I'm ready to train. Fine. Let's get back. At, let's get back out there. I'm going to train. I'm going to run. I'm going to do all the things. And then I got into Leadville again for 2020. Also signed up for another really hard hundred called Hellbender that I was very, that had been on my list for a while. I uh, was really excited about that one. And, uh, you know, 2020 came around. I was super pumped. And then, you know, I think we all know the story of 2020 COVID came along and took all the races with it. So uh, my re I like decided 2020 was going to be my redemption year after a terrible year of 2019. And uh, as soon as I got super excited and felt super trained, everything canceled and I was kind of devastated. I didn't get to have my like comeback year. Uh, so I was trying to dream of alternative challenges, basically. What does... Um... Like how, how long after that Leadville DNF, like, was it immediate? And it sounds like you were most mad, not at yourself in the race, but most mad that you knew you could have prepared better and you didn't. Like it was sort of a, I don't, I don't, wasted opportunity maybe. I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth that maybe aren't your words, but when, yeah. when did it hit you like you were mad at yourself? Uh, about four minutes after I decided to just call it quits. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that was when, I mean, right then and there, you gave yourself like this kick in the pants and said, never, never again will I. Yeah. We went back. Um, so I finally got, it was a really long ride with a really nice volunteer off the side of the mountain back to our Airbnb that we were staying in and then went in, changed clothes and took a little nap and then went back in the morning to watch the, like the last hour of all the finishers coming through. Uh, that sealed the deal for sure. I was like, sure. I'm coming back and I'm going to be ready. Yeah. yeah. What, what is it? I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by your you know, story. What, where does that come from in you? I mean, you're talking about somebody wasn't like athletic, did a little ballet, the soccer coach made fun of us. And now here you are running in some fairly um, prestigious races, talking about, you know, wanting to be up there in the midst of the race. Mm -hmm. um, where did that, where did that come from? I mean, like, did that, I mean, did that just come alive in you through running or maybe there was some of that hidden in you somewhere that you didn't know about when the yeah. soccer coach was making fun of you? Or, um, I mean, that's, that's fairly intense. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Well, I grew up as a twin and I have, there's four of us. So I have two brothers and a twin sister. Um, so I think we were all extremely competitive uh, growing up, like constant competition. And that's just, I don't know, like I'm very competitive and it's really hard to like not be that way. But I don't think I ever found an out, like outside of being a sibling, I don't think I ever found an outlet for the competition. And I guess running kind of like took, like drew that out of me more um, and I never dreamt that I would be like competitive or that that would be a part of it but uh, you know it's hard when you start going to not feel that competitive like drive to like race that next person that you see you know yeah yeah no I don't know but I'm, gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take your word for it you're one of those people I say all the time I love I love having these conversations because um because of like people like me, like I go to these races and then there'll be like a few people like you who their story is, I'm here because I think I can win this race. And then there's like everybody else. I mean, like I'm never going to be in a race where I'm standing there thinking this might be my day. I might win this thing. But so then it's like, it's a race. What am I doing here? And you know, the answers that people to have that that are, um, you know, me, it's a, it's a mental health deal. I mean, it's um, recovering from a lot of things in life. And I, you know, I find that's a lot of people's stories, but um, yeah. and maybe you have some of that, but clearly you also are part of this story. I think, not only I think I'm winning this thing today. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So yeah. And so then you had that fire. This is not happening to me again. You got back in that race you hadn't been able to get into along with <laughs> other races and then um, the great uh, soul crusher COVID comes along and says, I don't care much about your redemption story. We're, um, so, you know, when I read your, <laughs> when I read your race report, which is very, which was long, you said this is a novel and I'm glad it was, it was, it was, it was fun to read, but you were really skimpy on a detail that is always fascinating to me. So you said, you just kind of, casually mention all of what you just said and then uh, well we were sitting around the fire and then this idea of the Pinhati 350 fastest known uh, time chase came up and so then that was it I'm like no what <laughs> how, do, how does that like how are you sit, how does one sit around at a bonfire and decide trying to run 350 miles in less than five days approximately is a good idea like yeah yeah that, uh, that's a good question it's a good stretch uh i think um uh, it was my sister and tim uh and i think they know me well enough to know that i like i need a something big and a big challenge and something that's gonna like get me excited you know and so uh and i know that i love the Penhody trail from doing lots of races on it spending a lot of time on it it's just definitely and it's you know it's pretty local and so like it's just a trail that I love so much and I think 
I don't remember, maybe my sister suggested it. Uh, and at the time we had no idea how long the trail was, you know, it was kind of like, is it 50 miles? Is it 4,000 miles? We weren't really sure. You know, she was like, why don't you run the Pinhoti? And I was like, yeah, I love the Pinhoti. Let's do that. Also, like, let's see how long it is, you know, <laughs> just like Google A few details. <laughs> yeah. And so it was like, it came back, it was about 350 miles and uh, it sounded pretty terrifying, but also um, a distance that was doable within the week that I had off of work. Cause it was also like, okay, I can only, I have this one week off. I can do something during this week. So it can't be like something so long that it takes more than a week. I want it to be more than a challenge, like more than a day. Like I want it to be a significant challenge. I want it to motivate me. I want it to be something to work for. I want it to be like my big thing for the year in lieu of my big redemption year. Right. Right. And so that I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. So how big of a leap was this for you? So after you like said yes, and then you said, oh, well, wait a minute, I need to figure out exactly what I just said yes to. And you realized at some point you'd said yes to trying to run 350 miles in five, you know, five and a half days. Right. What, what was your previous sort of biggie? Like clearly you've run a hundred miles and right. clearly you've been away, you know, a day mm -hmm. running those races. And what had you done anything longer than a hundred miles? No, hundred is the longest. And the longest hundred I've done, I think was probably double top 100. And it was uh, with me getting lost, which is a constant theme of my life. Uh, I added some mileage. So it was more of like 112 miles for me. Um, and it was uh, in the thirties. I forget how many hours I was awake, but less than 40. So definitely less than two days. Um, and that was the longest. And I was, absolutely exhausted falling asleep on the trail and so uh it was a little terrifying to think about more days but i also knew that if it was that many days you'd have to factor in sleep so i was like well it'll be fine i'll sleep it'll be great so you get up from the bonfire you're now you're now sold on this thing and and you head off now how how far in advance of you actually tackling this thing that was the idea born? I mean, like when you talk about training, how long did you, you know, let this percolate and did you train for it? Or was this like, you know, pack up the next morning and go? Cause that does, that seems like something you might do, but yeah. what? It was a little more time than that. So it was like a right around the time. Uh, it was actually early May and uh, it was right when Western States got canceled. And so when Western got canceled, I was just like, okay, in the event that Leadville, because Leadville wasn't officially canceled yet, but I was like, I see the writing on the wall. They're right after each other. They're both big events. Uh, so I was like, in the event that Leadville cancels, I need a plan, guys. I need a plan, you know. Um, but I do remember it was like very beginning of May. And seriously, I like came up with this idea. We looked up the FKT. At uh, that time, it was six days and something. Uh, and then I woke up the next morning and found out that Caleb Yon was actually like out there finishing his last day of that, the Pinhody FKT. And I had no idea he'd even started it or was out there or anything when we came up with the ideas. So that was pretty cool to like come up with the idea and then find out someone's out there actually doing it. And so then obviously he set the new, the five and a half day um, time. So that was kind of cool. It was also made me excited because I was like, oh, it's like active. People are doing it. There's right. competition out there. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not going to let him keep this very long. So that's very <laughs> cool because <Yeah>. <laughs> my sort of competitive, wherever they came from, juices are really flying now. Um, let me, before I, before I go there. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know like how busy your nurse schedule is. You, I mean, you seem to be busy um how i don't know when i think about a hundred mile race it just seems like you would have to be like training forever like i just ran at the georgia jewel my first i finally finished that you know <laughs> race i've been tackling for years and so i finally ran you know 30 i guess 37 miles whatever it was but I, you know, like I ran all summer, like I, my pandemic time has been like, I've had more freedom and flexibility. And I did the race, a virtual race across Tennessee and back. So like, I was always, I was always running. Um, yeah. Where do you find time to do and how much time do you put into it? 
uh, a lot. I'm also always running. Um, I work a pretty regular schedule. I work uh, like seven to three, Monday through Friday. So I get off at a pretty decent time in the afternoon, usually to give me a little time to run before everyone else is off work and back from school and all that kind of stuff. So it definitely eats into like family time and things like that. So luckily I have a very patient partner who lets me do that. Um, and he was also training. So Tim also ran the Georgia Dual 37 miler as his very first ultra. Oh, nice. But he was nice. also training a whole lot this summer. So the summer, it was all about running this summer for sure for both of us. I know it's a lot of creative time. There was a lot of times on the weekends where I would uh, try to squeeze in a long run on like go Saturday afternoon, evening, you know, try to squeeze it in. Um, just weird hours, uh, just being creative and figuring it out and getting the miles in, yeah. but it wasn't always like ideal times. I definitely spent a few or several really early mornings on the treadmill at like four o'clock in the morning, trying to get the miles in before a long day at work. Cause I knew I wouldn't want to do it when I got home. So right. being creative, figuring it out, having a supportive partner that helps you do it too. And in terms of the hundred milers, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm just fascinated by people who run that distance. Um, and I know it's all of it's challenging, but what is the most challenging piece of that? Is it the physics, just being physically capable of doing it? Is it the mental piece? How important is the, I mean, how do you do the, like, I've never figured out nutrition for like a marathon. So I'm yeah. like, how on earth does somebody figure out the nutrition for like a hundred miles and 24 hours, that race, what, what is it the most challenging piece to you or, or all of the above? It's a bit of all of the above, but I feel like you do, once you figure out the nutri nutrition for like your long runs, you just do that and keep repeating it until you get through provided your stomach holds up. Mine doesn't always do that, but, um, you know, you just do the same thing that works for all your long runs. You know, if you can run, I always say like, if you can run a 50 K, you can run a hundred miler. It's all the same. You just keep doing the same thing. It all becomes a mental challenge at some point. Can you talk yourself through it or talk yourself out of it? Um, and that's, I think the hardest piece is like believing that you can do it and making it feel like it's a distance that you can do, you know, a half marathon seemed like an insurmountable distance at one point. And then that's like not even a training run on a Saturday, you know, at uh, some point. And now, you know, 100 miles seems real short to me right now. <laughs> so uh, <Yeah. laughs> it's all just like a big mental exercise of like how you frame it and how you prepare for that day. Like there's days where I can barely finish a five mile training run because uh, I just wasn't prepared for it. And there's days where 100 miles seems easy. Um, it just depends on how you like go into the day too. What kind of conversations are you having out there in these hundred milers when you have to be somewhat human like the rest of us? I mean, you you have to be in these spaces where you just don't want to go on. What mm -hmm. what mental where where do you draw on to talk yourself into going instead of quitting? Uh I think it all becomes I get really hard on myself. And so that makes it really hard to quit because I know that I'm gonna beat myself up and it's uh, a matter of like okay, yeah, you can quit. Sure. There's like, no one's going to fault you for it. You've run a really long way and this is really hard, but how are you going to like, how am I going to feel about it to myself? Like tomorrow or tonight or in four months from now. Um, and a lot of it is, that's a lot of it. <laughs> it's like right. me being really hard on myself and two, just like you signed up for this, you trained for this. This is what you wanted. It's hard right now, but who cares if it's hard right now? Like, that's not the point. The point is that you can overcome that hardship and then you can figure it out. And then no matter how hard it feels at some point, you get past that hard and you get at, like the high after that really low is so much higher than it would have been before. Just battle the demons and get through that part and you'll be way back on top again and you'll feel great. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, and, and you do seem like somebody who probably has the capacity to really be hard on herself if you don't don't get through it. So we're we're out there now. Uh, we've we've we got this bonfire idea. We're going to tackle this like race day or trail tackling day. What what are you I mean what are you thinking when you're you're lined up and in your mind because we clearly know now you weren't going out there to try in your mind I'm going to do this thing. So in your mind you're about to 
go three, you're about to go 350 miles in five days. Yeah. So I don't even know how, I mean, I can't relate. So what, is, what are you thinking being there? Like, are you scared, excited? Um, yeah, I was super nervous. I was scared. I was really excited. Uh, it was kind of all the things. I was also kind of like, oh, this is like a long way. <laughs> <laughs> when you really like start to face it, you're like, oh, crap, this is, this yeah. is far. Um, I would have figured that out like at the bonfire. So the fact that you, that didn't come to you until like you were standing there, it's probably one of your strengths. thinking until then. And uh, I was like, okay, this is really far. Uh, but I don't know, I was just excited. I was, I had like my brother and my sister, Tim, my friend Fawn was there. And like, I knew other people were coming in at different points to help out. And um, there was so much excitement about all the people that were there that I was excited to see and spend time with and like do this thing with. And I love the trail. I love being out on the trail. I love a challenge. This is obviously a challenge beyond challenges. Um, so I was just excited to see how I would do like, I had absolutely no way to gauge how I would feel. I've never done more than 100 miles, you know, 112 or whatever. Um, and so to try to guess what I would feel like or how I'd perform or like what my body would feel like 200 miles in, 300 miles in, like I just had no idea. And I was kind of excited to find out. Yeah. So like, yeah, let's go. Let's just see what happens, you know? So I think I read like the first day, 24 hours into this thing, uh, you, you covered, I don't know, 74 miles somewhere around there. What did you find out that first day? Like you, you're 24 hours into it, which is sort of your time comfort zone. You've been there before. And so yeah. at, at that point, are you thinking, oh, okay, this, this is doable. Or are you, yeah. are you feeling it or what do you, cause I gotta tell you, I mean, I was following, along because I, I don't know maybe I missed something along the way I mean it's not like I'm following every word you say every day but this thing kind of sprang up like all of a sudden yeah maybe you're just kind of low-key and quiet like I tell the world <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about it a year ahead of time like I always say the funnest part of running for me is talking about it but then you got to get there and do it I'm like oh golly but <laughs> I mean, I read that one morning that you were, I think it was like you were there and yeah. like, what? She's <laughs> doing what? I didn't make um, a deal until then, but uh, yeah, then the first day I was like tired, but like felt really good. Cause like, that was my goal for the day is to make 74, that make it to Adam's Gap, the 74 miles. And so to like get there and make my goal distance for the first day felt really good. I was a, probably like two hours behind schedule from where I really wanted to be, but I feel like at that point, I was like, it's fine. Like, we got a long way to go. Don't worry about schedules at this point. Like, and the schedule is based on like absolutely no knowledge, you know? So like, I've never done 300 miles. So I don't know how to make a schedule for that. So I felt good. It was really good. And then I like rolled into the RV and took a nap. Uh, and then I woke up in the morning. And then by the morning, I mean like two and a half, I think three hours was like, that was my nap. And that was the longest nap I'd take throughout the whole thing. But uh, I woke up ready to go again. I think that was the time that the reality set in of I just had a really long run and I wasn't even kind of close. Right. I still had 275 miles or whatever to go. And that, that number felt undoable to me <laughs> and overwhelming. Uh, and so the tears started for sure, just like from a, I don't know, just like emotionally realizing what was happening. I was excited to get going. I was excited to get more miles going. Uh, but it was definitely like a tearful start just from like a, the gravity of the situation setting in. I think. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I can't even imagine it. So, I mean, cause you just were, you were in 74 miles. Mm -hmm. Like my idea of a nap after 74 miles would be like three days, but you <laughs> had like three hours, you know, two, three hours and you're back up. And yeah, I mean, you're sitting, you're sitting there saying those kind of numbers. Like I remember, Georgia Jewel at the turnaround point, like I wanted to cry because I knew I had to turn around and go back 18 miles. I mean, it's <laughs> like 200 and yeah, I mean, you're talking just numbers that I would, you know, if I ran 74, I'd be too tired to even drive 275 miles. So, okay. but so you're crying, you're, how, how do you finally get yourself ready to, okay, that's over. Let's, let's roll. 
Yeah, I just like, I was kind of just crying, like as I went through all the motions, you know, getting dressed, getting my pack ready, you know, my crew's up, they're helping me get some food in, getting my pack filled up. And uh, my friend Stacy had planned to get up and start running in the morning with me. And so she was there ready to go, chipper and happy, supportive. And it wasn't like, I didn't like let it stall me really. I just let the tears come as I went through the motions and just knew that this is, you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, and of course I had like really supportive people all around me just telling me it's going to be great. You're doing great. You know, so that was like helpful. Everybody was happy. Everybody was really supportive and we just took off. Uh, and by take off, I mean, we walked <laughs> the first bit cause I was crying too much. Uh, but Stacy was like super sweet. Talked me, you know, it was just like really nice and talked me through it and finally got like, like what is a friend saying to you in that moment because like she's fresh I mean yeah. so there's like some guilt here I would think it would be <laughs> me um so what what is she saying to you to kind of help you I mean is this is this a snap out of it type friend or is she just no and I probably like later on I probably needed that but she was super sweet I don't remember exactly what she said but just like really supportive and nice and she had run with me the day before and so we'd had you know we had like a, a running rhythm going and just supportive of like you can do this you're so strong and like just like extremely nice sweet things um and then you just kind of realize like I can't, you know, this is like a friend who's volunteering her time. Like I can't sit here and cry my way through this. She's like out here being volunteering her time, being super sweet and supportive. I got to get my shit together and just start running. Okay. Like this is what we're here for. And so then you kind of like snap into it really quickly. And you're like, okay, like game day, let's go. You know? And then like, I just like feel a switch go and I'm like, okay, forget the tears. Let's just get this. Let's just go. Let's get it done. Well, and, and everybody was good. Um, your your team, your family, I guess, were posting a lot of pictures and videos. And I mean, I remember thinking, I mean, I remember probably after that first day into the second day, I'm like, oh my God, she looks as fresh and smiley mm -hmm. as she did at the start. What on, how, I mean, how far did you end up going that, that second day then? You knocked off 74 the first day. How far did you get two days? The second day was really slow going. We were on some really poorly marked trails and a lot of like big boulder fields and just really like hard to like run on stuff. So we, I spent most of the day lost trying to find the trail. And then when we did find the trail, it was like not super runnable. So it was very slow. So I think I did like 55 or so that second day. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a little frustrating of a day, but you know, try to keep going and try to get some miles done frustrations hard enough to deal with like when you've had sleep and haven't run a hundred and some miles was yeah did that compound everything i mean was the frustration even worse i would imagine or how did that i was surprised it actually like it was there for sure but i was somehow able to just like push it down and like just talk myself to like you don't have time for the frustration like, you've got to make distance like you've got to get miles behind you you don't have time to like sulk and be sad about being frustrated like you don't really have time for that like the feelings were there but I just like remember like talking like very purposely talking myself through it and, like you don't have time for that like you gotta let that go um so I tried to not let it bother me but it was definitely there <laughs> yeah and and so did you nap or sleep at all at the end of that day yeah that was a whole different story so I finally got off the trail that night um my friend Kendall was with me at the last little section and we finally made it to where I was hoping to take a nap uh wasn't quite as far as I wanted to make it but I was just ready for a little nap and uh met my crew and then they informed me that the camper the RV so a lot of the, was actually 0.7 miles up this trail and I look and it's straight up <laughs> Um, and it was just like a little more than I think I could emotionally handle at the time. And I kind of lost it and started just kind of like sobbing. Um, uh, you know, we finally just like, I made peace with it and I was like, okay, we just got to go. And like, I'm sobbing, I'm upset and like, don't talk to me. <laughs> like, right. I'm going to go. I can't believe we have to do this. Uh, not their fault at all. It's just the roads were impossible. Um, and then, so we had to just hike it up 0.7 miles straight uphill to the camper um 
I sobbed the entire way, like hardcore sobbed. Uh, and I think everybody was quite uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, it was like all the emotions I could possibly handle at that point. Then I laid down for about an hour before we got back up. And then uh, my friend Stacy was again up with me in the morning in my sobbing state. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you just sob right through your yeah. nap or? Yeah. Basically, so we just like got up and then started again at like an hour later and, uh, you know, had to run 0.7 miles back down to the trail to even start trail miles again. Um, but then those next couple miles were actually really nice and really runnable. We had like a really nice morning running the first little section. It was good. So you're, um, you know, after two days, I guess, what are you, 130 miles into this or? Yeah. close to there okay. yeah. and I mean so in your mind I mean you're a hot you've had two long hard days you yeah. sobbed you had mountain climb to get to your one hour nap and and in your mind I mean you still have to be doing the math I mean you're still 220 miles in three days of that to go like yeah I it was overwhelming <laughs> yeah I mean at that point how are you even I don't know. I mean, that, it's a mentality I don't get, but clearly you have it. But that, the math in that one and the tired and... It was a lot. I am um, a joke, or my sister makes fun of me a lot because I always do trail math, you know. Um, I'm always calculating, like, how fast do I need to go? Can I make it in this time? Can I do that? And I'm horribly bad at doing trail math when I'm tired. Way off. Like, I'm just bad at math in general and really bad at trail math when I'm tired. Um, and so the, I spend the entire day trying to like make the numbers work in my head, you know, and I don't have a piece of paper and all this stuff and I can't like carry the one and all the things. And, uh, it took me, like, I spent the majority of that third day trying to figure out the math of how I was going to get the rest of these miles done in time for the, to, to beat the record. And it literally took me the entire day to figure the math out. And I finally got to a point where I was like, guys, I figured it out. I finally got the math to work. It was like such a great moment. I was like, yes, I did it. <laughs> but that takes up a lot of your, your time, your mental space, I guess, right. to figure stuff like that out. Because in your mind, at no point were you, I mean, you're not in it to finish. You're not in it to run three on the, th you're in it to do it faster than anybody's ever done it. I mean, that's your whole mindset in this. Yeah. You're not trying to calculate how I mean, for me, it's easy, like 100, 130 miles, I only have 220 miles to finish this daggone thing, but you're yeah. not, that's not your math. You're trying to, you're in it to win it. Yeah, yeah. And you don't, you don't even try to hide from that. No, <laughs> that was my goal. So yeah, that's, that's what it is. So you got your, you got your trail math done. You, how far did you go the third day then? How, I mean, how? Uh, the third day, I think, was probably 65 or 70 miles, somewhere in there. So you're, I mean, you're almost at 200 miles. Yeah. So yeah, imagine. I crested 200 miles the morning that, like the end of that day, like the morning between third and fourth day. Yeah. So at that point, I mean, not that I can relate, but you're <clears throat> at that point, 200 miles, the numbers start to sound at least a little friendlier. I yes. mean, yes. you yes. You don't have, you know, 150 to go to me is a long way to go. But in your world at that point, it felt good. It felt a lot better. So back when I ran, when I hit a hundred miles on the trail, uh, there was actually some little, and my friend Fawn was with me pacing me then. And on the trail, somebody had laid out some sticks that said like 100. Um, and I was, you know, we were like so excited to get there and then we finally made it to 100. And then I just remember this like distinct, like sinking feeling like this doesn't feel good. Actually, this feels kind of terrible because I still have 250 miles to go. Like, right. and I've gone a hundred miles. Like I just wanted to get out of there. I was like, this doesn't feel good. I thought this would be exciting and a like celebration. And it did not feel like that when we finally got there for me. Um, but then finally getting to the, the 200 mile mark felt a lot more fun and a lot more exciting. And that like, that to me was like, okay, we've made a distance. Not only did we make a distance, but it's like a distance, like that's way farther than I've ever gone before. So it also felt like a really good milestone. Right. At that point, like I'd have been, <laughs> anything now's bonus, right? But your, <laughs> your mind is still, no, now, now we got to finish this thing. So you're, I guess, 
going into day four, how tired are you at this point? How tired are you? How hungry are you? How grumpy are you? How are all these things? Somebody who has been awake for 72 hours with about four hours of naps in there feeling. Yeah. Uh, it's very tired, uh, extremely tired. Um, but I was pretty shocked actually. It wasn't until like late that night, the fourth night that I actually finally felt my eyes feeling heavy. Um, which normally is something I battle in a hundred miler. And so the fact that I made it that far without that feeling, I was really surprised about, um, I didn't feel terrible. You know, I felt hungry, but, uh, nutrition wise the whole time I actually felt good. I didn't really have any major struggles, no major dips, no major nausea or anything like that. I don't know how my stomach cooperated, but it did like nutrition wise, stomach wise. I felt great the entire time. What were you, what were you? what were you fueling with? I mean, regular food, were you, were you following your whole strategy of, you know, nutrition you use in a 50 K just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Or yeah, basically, um, I did the same stuff I usually do. I had some of the same chews and, uh, like sport beans and these like scratch chews that I use that I really like always. I had those with me at all times. Um, I used rock teen, which I use a lot. Um, but then, obviously that's not enough to do something like this. And so real food was the other thing. And that's how I do, that's how I feel for everything. Like all the goos and all the stuff just don't work for me. Real food is really what I need. And so, yeah, I had uh, some great stuff. My brother came up with a concoction called the pizza dia, which is one of the best things I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, it's basically a quesadilla with like pizza sauce and pepperoni in with mozzarella cheese all in the middle. It's very good. I had multiples of those on the second day. I found, when I finally discovered those on day two, that was like all I wanted. Uh, day three was all like the breakfast burritos, uh, like bacon, egg and cheese burritos basically, which were super tasty. And then uh, I think day three maybe was, my friend Ben showed up with like six Impossible Whoppers. <laughs> And so I had a whole bunch of Whoppers just con They were so good. So yeah, I had a whole lot of really good. All right. So you were eating. I was eating. Yeah. yeah. For sure. So day, day four, then I forget exactly. I think you ended up going about four and a half days. Um, so how far did we get the end of this fourth day? The fourth day, I think it was another 65 or 70 day, somewhere around there. My math is probably off somewhere. Yeah, so you're, I mean, you're closing in on 260, 270. And then, then I think is the next day then when you finally called it, I guess, at what, 281 miles, I think? Yeah, it was like, uh, so on my watch, it was 281. Uh, and that, that was all like getting lost and running extra miles, chasing down the trail. Um, but I actually made it, it was like 265 trail miles um, to Snake Creek Gap. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, what, what was it where you finally just said, we're, we're done? Uh, so every, I mean, everything had hurt for a long time. My feet were killing me. My legs were hurting. Everything was hurting my neck, my shoulders, all the things hurt, but I expected to hurt. And so that was, you know, fine. And I had made peace with all that. And I was like, it's fine. Who cares if it hurts? You're not going to run for a month after this. Who cares? Just let it hurt and we'll keep going. Um, and so I'd, you know, been running and hurting for days and I uh, was fine with it. But then my left ankle shin, I guess, I'm not really sure what to call it, but started hurting uh, and then just kind of continued. And I've been taking like Tylenol and stuff just to kind of help with all the aches and pains and it helped tremendously. I would feel great after I took it. Um, but this one pain in my foot just like would not go away and yeah. didn't respond to any of the Tylenol or anything and just got worse and worse and worse. Um, and the night that last night, the fourth night, um, it just got so severe. It was really, really terrible. It was a hurt to take any steps. Uh, I'd probably been running on it pretty painful for like 30, 40 miles. And, uh, it just got to a point that it was like really, really painful. Um, so I was kind of hobbling in, uh, I found a stick on the trail that I was using as like my little crutch. <laughs> so hobbled into the last aid station at Pocket Road. And um, I was also like confounded by the fact that I got uh, my pacer, James, and I got really lost on top of Johns Mountain. It was just kind of a crazy 
last little section before pocket road so we came in and it was just like emotionally i was like done physically my leg was killing me and i just needed a break so I took a two-hour nap and got up the next morning and uh was just ready to get going again just like i had been doing and you know every time i take a little break i'd wake up and get going i'd be so stiff you know you right. can't really right. move you can barely walk <laughs> But you start walking a little bit and you get going and like everything loosens up and then you find that you can run a little bit and you're okay. So it's going to be the same thing. Uh, but that morning it just uh, didn't quite work the same. I did uh, started that morning with a six mile section with my friend Whitney. And uh, I, it was well, normally I felt better after I got going. Uh, my foot just got worse and worse and worse. And it was absolutely throbbing and on fire by the time I got to Snake Creek Gap. So um, just had to do some assessment and evaluation and figure out, you know, I have 84 more miles or something like that, whatever the math was, left to go. Uh, it, it is throbbing every time I take a step. Uh, and so like, was it smart? Was I risking any kind of long-term damage, which is always the fear? Who knows if I was or wasn't, I don't know, but it was gonna be some 84 really painful miles. Right. Uh, and it had slowed me down so much that I just didn't think that the the, the record just wasn't in reach at that point. So, uh, which caused me to do a lot more like thinking and evaluating and what are my goals here? You yeah. Know? Well, I mean, <laughs> that's amazing to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that story, what was the, um, like, what was the best part of being out? I mean, you were out there for four four and a half days outside of the, you know, the personal fulfillment of, you know, doing something most people will never be able to do physically, but just being out there on the trails, what, I don't know, what did it do for you? Uh, so much. I feel like I came back like kind of different, but uh, it was really nice to um, completely disconnect from the entire world. Like I had no idea what was going on in the world, which is kind of a nice thing these days. Yeah uh gift so you know, yeah it was like a really nice peaceful lovely time just to be out and like we had absolutely perfect weather it was like really warm in the daytime you know but like lovely and really comfortable at night um just peaceful nice time in the woods uh it's like cleansing and like i don't know soul searching kind of times um and then on top of that just like i couldn't believe how incredible all the people were that came to help and like wanted to help me do this, um, achieve this crazy, stupid goal of running some crazy amount of miles. But like the people made it the experience and I didn't expect that to be, I didn't expect that to be the experience that I have out there. I thought it was just gonna be grinding and getting miles and doing the thing. But I actually had such an incredible experience just seeing how kind and how generous and like how loving all these people were, some that I like didn't know it all and some that I barely knew, some that I knew really well, um, all coming together and all working together and all figuring it out. Just like one common goal for this one person. Uh, and I was just like overwhelmed at the kindness of people. And that was like, that was the experience of this whole thing for me was just the people. Um, yeah. it, um, <clears throat> well, a couple of things, one, like I said, I was following you along and you could feel that like everybody who would post for you or was cheering you on. I mean, they, they were like all in on your corner. And when people are like that, even, you know, back in Richmond on Facebook, you're like, you can feel it, you yeah. know, um, and you, I've been on that trail, you know, Georgia Jewel and seeing so kind of like be there. And um, so you could feel that. And, and the people and you know the ultra community and I know it wasn't like a race but I interviewed um, Whitney Richmond the other day and she was talking about the ultra community and, and she said it's it's always been this community that just seems to embrace this whole idea that it takes a village like they yeah. they all want to help you succeed and I was telling her about like my race at the Georgia Jewel the cool thing about that race this year was that because of the COVID precautions it was out and back for you know 37 mile and I said that 
the most amazing thing to the, cause I'm slow and because I did the 37. So all the hundred milers and the 50 milers had taken off. So the really fast ones, mm -hmm. they were on their way back, like to their finish line. And here I am lumbering along, just trying to finally finish this crazy thing that had beat me up for years. But every one of them like stopped and said, man, you got this good job. Like they're running, winning, going for their race, but they stopped to kind of be that village, you know, and it meant a lot, you know, it, it, it's, gives you, it's great. <laughs> no, it was awesome. But so when you describe that, it's like this, it's, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know where there are other communities like that. You're clearly a good person. You're easy to just rally mm -hmm. and want to get, get around. But I, you know, I see people doing that in that, that whole community. Yeah, absolutely. There, it's it's such an amazing community, and everybody was so giving and so kind. Um, and I just, I don't know. I think I just hadn't in, I hadn't thought about that and hadn't anticipated it. And I was so shocked and like in such a good way, yeah. um, and so surprised and like just felt, I don't know, so fulfilled by just that part of it. I was like, I don't care about the rest of it at all. This experience with all these people was an experience I'll never get to do again. Um, and so like I just try to treasure that for what it was and it definitely made the whole experience amazing yeah it's a great community and i'm so grateful so after after this in your um write-up you wrote something i wrote it down it says i went further than i ever thought possible i felt better than i ever thought possible and i completely surprised myself i had the experience of a lifetime so i, I was because I know you've done a lot of like big things. I was curious, I actually underlined, you completely surprised yourself. What, what did you, what was most surprising about what you did? I guess just physically, like I couldn't believe that like I felt, you know, all in all, I felt fine uh, 250 miles into the whole thing. Like I, you know, obviously there's aches and pains. I'm stiff, I'm sore, I'm tired, I'm all the things, but like, I thought I would feel so much worse than I did and I didn't. I thought I'd be so much more tired and out of it. And I feel like I was mentally sharp and like in there and in it and with it and totally motivated the whole time. I thought that I'd want to quit way more than I did and I didn't. Um, I don't know. I just, it was, I felt better than I thought I could ever feel doing that. And I just couldn't believe that I was like, yeah, this is it. This is my life now. I'm just running forever and I'm yeah. fine with it. <laughs> so was it, um, like, was it what you had hoped for? I mean, going back 2020 was going to be your redemption year and you missed out on your races, but did this at least make up for that and maybe even supersede any redemption you could have hoped to get this year? Yeah, I think it definitely took the place. I mean, the whole goal was to give me something to work towards and to like uh, motivate me to train and have a goal. Um, so obviously that was fulfilled. Uh, it gave me a challenge for sure, <laughs> like no other challenge I've had. Um, yeah, and I, you know, like at the end of the day, I didn't finish the attempt, but uh, I still feel like I worked so much harder and I did so much more than I thought I could do. And so I think it absolutely fulfilled what I needed it to do and what I was looking for. It, it has me like fired up and ready to go and train for the next thing so much harder. Um, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. I'm really glad I did it. You know, I don't know if I'll do it again just yet, but uh, it was, it definitely fulfilled all the things that I needed it to be. So I'm curious and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you let you go, but you know, you are clearly one of those people like, wow, I did this half marathon. I think I'll do a marathon. Oh, I think I'll run a hundred miles. Oh, I think I'll run the Pinhoti Trail. <laughs> what like has your mind already been stirring in terms of wow, I did that. I completely surprised myself. Are you curious what your next surprise is for for Lauren? Or have you yeah. kind of allowed yourself time to dream of something that you hadn't because you just did this? Oh, absolutely. I think it makes so many more things attainable and approachable. Um, I think that I never would have thought I would even entertain. So yeah, I mean, my mind's always dreaming and wanting to do things. So 
we'll see what's next. I'm not sure yet. Obviously, yeah. Leadville. I'm going back to Leadville for sure in 2021. So, yeah. you know, the whole goal was to go after that. So, well, we'll I don't know yet. Lauren, I am so thankful we had this conversation. It's inspiring. You're an incredible person. So I'm, I'm grateful that you would take the time to share your story with us. And I know me personally, I, you know, I, I have these conversations for very selfish reasons, because I want to be better. I want to be inspired. I want to learn everything I can about not just, and probably the least of which is how do you run far, run fast, but it's just this character makeup, this mental makeup, you know, how, how, how do I become a better and stronger person these conversations always do that and and i like having them and sharing them because i hope it does that for other people i just think there's so much about life to be learned in running and in sharing our running stories and so i'm really really thankful that you gave us the time to um, share your story well thank you so much for having me it's really sweet well i hope you enjoyed that conversation with lauren jones i think she is just this gentle spirit but with this really unique sort of toughness to her. I think that came out loud and clear, especially when she talked about all that went wrong at the Leadville 100, this dream race in her life. She's finally there and just kind of due to being unprepared, it did not go well for her. And, you know, she could have crawled in a hole after that, but I love that she said it was like immediate and it was the next day standing there at the finish line, watching the finishers come in when she said, never again. And it sounds like she really recommitted herself to this whole running thing and promised herself that 2020 was going to be different. And then along came COVID, you know, all these big plans. A lot of us have been there. A lot of us had things mapped out for this year that have been sort of snuffed out by this virus. I know there are probably thousands and thousands of stories out there like hers. But plan B, right? We all have a an opportunity to come up with a plan B. I don't know if I'm going to come up with a plan B quite as B as her wild, let's go tackle the Penhody 350-mile trail. But again, listening to that conversation, I don't think any of us are any longer surprised that that was her plan and what a story she told about being out there. So I found this to be a really inspiring, I think, like always, it's a great inspiration as a runner, but just so much to carry over into life. When life throws curveballs at us, we are all in the middle of a curveball right now, the COVID curveball. And, you know, listening to Lauren, I think we get a little insight, maybe a little guidance how we can think through this thing. I like how much time she spent talking about how she talks to herself, how she gets herself back in a healthier place than being down and beaten up by the circumstances. So I hope you took something away from this like I did. I can't wait to someday have her on again. I could talk to her all day long. Um, she's just lights a fire in you. And I'll need that fire. I am headed out this Friday. Um, my own sort of COVID interference. I was signed up to run the Richmond Marathon this year. The Richmond Marathon was my first marathon back in 2016. In 2018, I ran my friend, teenage friend, uh, Colby Wishnet's first half marathon with him. And here we are two years later now, and Colby decided this is the year he's going to tackle his first marathon. So we were both registered to run the Richmond Marathon back in November, well, here in November 2020, but all things COVID, and so the race has turned virtual. But Richmond's done a good job coming up with an alternative plan. They got some timing stations, water stations set up where people can all come and run this thing virtually on the Capitol Trail. So my buddy Colby, 16 years old, showing up Friday, he and I tackling 26 miles of the Capitol Trail, our virtual Richmond Marathon. Um, I got a lot of miles in the summer, but it's been a long time since I covered 26.2 at one time. So I'm a little nervous. 
be a little responsible for making sure Colby gets across that finish line for his first marathon. So one way or another, we're going to get it done. I have a feeling I'll be leaning a lot on this conversation with Lauren and just sort of how I talk myself, uh, talk to myself, how I talk to my mind, and hopefully that will prepare me to talk pretty healthy to Colby along the way. Hopefully I can be a good cheerleader, which I'm known sometimes not to be a great cheerleader. Anyhow, I'll be back next week, probably with a little recap on the Richmond Marathon, maybe include a little conversation with my buddy Colby after we finish this thing. So I hope you'll come back. I think it'll be a great, great conversation. Always love having you listening in. And until next time, hey, y'all have a great, great week.